The Harrier GR7 is a second generation version of the famous Harrier jump jet and flies for the British tech tree in War Thunder. Let's check it out. The original first generation Harrier jump jets were a resounding success, but it was obvious that more could be done if the design was refined a bit to iron out some of the shortcomings. A program was started in the United States to update the Harrier in the late 1970s, and the UK eventually signed on as a partner after a significant amount of back and forth and haggling over workload sharing, materials, and specifications for the final design. Now, the eventual result was simply called the Harrier II, and while it shared an outward appearance and general layout with the original Harrier, this really was almost a brand new aircraft. It was larger, had a more powerful version of the Pegasus engine, leading edge root extensions, and more surface area on the wing, additional weapon hardpoints, and significantly upgraded internal equipment. Importantly, the new jet was intended from the onset to focus on interdiction of ground targets behind enemy lines, and that new role dictated a number of the design choices along the way. The new Harrier entered service with the U.S. Marine Corps and the Royal Navy in the late 1980s, with a fair number of differences cropping up between the two countries' versions of the plane. The British jet was designated the Harrier GR-5, with the GR-7 and 9 eventually following as upgrade packages to the GR-5 airframes. In UK service, it was deployed to a fair number of hotspots, and it actually ended up seeing combat many times. Additionally, the Harrier II was deployed for carrier service, and was eventually withdrawn from service in the UK in 2011, with most of their fleet of jets being sold to the United States to use as spare parts. What we get in War Thunder is the Harrier GR-7, a strike jet in rank 7 of the British Air Tree with a battle rating of 11.0. This jet doesn't have a radar set, but it still has a very sophisticated weapon system, which includes a full ballistics computer, a built-in forward-looking infrared system, which isn't the same thing as an infrared search and track, and it can carry a laser designator pod. Now, before anything else, let's talk about the FLIR setup. This thing works kind of like having a built-in targeting pod, even without any guided air-to-ground weapons or anything. You can switch views into it, zoom around, and toggle the thermals. This can be useful in night battles, or if you're trying to spot something on the ground that's hidden in trees. If you take the external targeting pod, it basically replaces this, and it can designate targets for your air-to-ground weapons. Now, speaking of weapons, the GR-7 gets an enormously flexible custom loadout setup, with rockets, bombs, missiles, and countermeasure pods. Some of the missile pylons will actually come with countermeasure dispensers built in, and you can't take the gun pods and the targeting pod at the same time. The air-to-air -air missile you get is the AIM-9L. This is a high-performance, all-aspect heat seeker with 30 Gs of pull and pretty good range for a dogfight missile. The AIM-9L is currently the best version of the Sidewinder in the game, and the GR-7 can take four of them. Not bad. For air-to-ground weapons, you can take three different types of laser-guided bombs. All of these require the external targeting pod. You can take the Mark 13, the Paveway 2, or the Paveway 3 in different quantities respective of their weight. As with all laser-guided bombs, accuracy is going to depend pretty heavily on a number of factors, but you should try to keep the target lazed until impact regardless. The GR-7 also gets the AGM-64D. This is an infrared-guided version of the Maverick with very long range and a powerful warhead. It differs from the TV-guided versions in that it locks heat sources on the ground, and sometimes it can be a little tricky to use as dead flaming tanks seem to distract it a bit at longer ranges. A very important note on this, since it doesn't have the TV guidance camera, the zoom and resolution on the seeker view is awful and difficult to lock targets with. The good news is, 
this missile can actually slave to the external targeting pod for target designation, which is considerably easier than trying to use the missile's built-in seeker view. To do this, just make sure you have the Mavericks selected as your active weapon, switch into the laser designator, pick your target, and hit your keybinds to spool up and fire the missile. That's it. Just as a disclaimer, this isn't a fast missile, and at longer ranges, the accuracy isn't the best. It's an excellent weapon, just don't expect miracles. In terms of flight performance, the GR-7 is simply amazing. It has a tremendous thrust-to-weight ratio, accelerates like a rocket, and has outstanding agility. It turns significantly better than earlier versions of the Harrier, and it retains energy quite well. But, even if it didn't, the engine power would more than compensate. The only real downside is that it's a subsonic jet, and you can't really push past about Mach 0.9. Another caveat is that the engine can overheat if you fly around on full throttle, so when you're not in combat, consider, you know, powering down a little bit. This will preserve the health of the engine, plus it helps manage your airspeed, since the GR-7 can fly right through the red line if you let it. It has limited WEP since it still uses the compressed water system as that the earlier Harriers had, and it'll run out eventually. Also, just like the earlier Harriers, this plane can do viffing, vectoring in forward flight, where you pivot your engine nozzles to get a little extra maneuvering. Play around with that feature in test flying just to get a feel for it. Flying the GR-7 out into air battles gives enough flexibility to go in for air combat, ground pounding, or going multi-role. If you want to focus on air combat, just take the four sidewinders and the gun pods. The plane doesn't have any radar, but it accelerates really fast, so you're going to have to be careful not to find yourself out in front of the rest of your team, since, as always, the planes with the best radar should be up in front. The GR-7 is good enough in a dogfight to hold its own in most 1v1 engagements, and the good news is that if you do get tangled up in a furball, you can just periodically dump countermeasures all over the place, since the plane has almost a bottomless supply. No tracers for the gun pods, though, so you're literally shooting blind. Just trust your instincts and use the force or something, I don't know. If you fly out for a ground pounding or multi-roll, just use the dumb bombs. You can take the precision-guided weapons and get basically guaranteed kills on ground units, but you'll usually get more points just base bombing. Now in close air support, the GR-7 tends to be really hit or miss. Since this is at what is still currently the highest tier, you have the most modern SPAA in the game to contend with, and it's not uncommon at all to fly out and just get 2S6 within 15 seconds of spawning in, still side climbing before you even get anywhere near the battlefield. Now the upside is that the plane's weapons are all very effective, and it has an auto tracker, which gives you the flexibility with the LGBs to just point and click, or follow them in to adjust targets if, like, the tank you dropped on gets killed or something. I had reasonably good luck dropping my bomb from high altitude, and then switching into the targeting pod and finding the target after the fact. It's risky in that you might waste the bomb, but it's safer because you can stay up higher for longer. I also have to say that, given the amount of countermeasures the GR-7 has, I had a lot of fun with this jet, just doing low-level passes over the battlefield, dumping countermeasures all over the place, and attacking with rocket pods. It sometimes can take, like, four or five kills worth of spawn points if you want to get into the LGBs or the Mavericks, so don't ignore the unguided weapons. This is a totally credible strike jet with all of its ordnance. Visually, this thing is a beauty. I've always liked the look of the Harrier, and this just takes all the good bits and makes them even better. My only gripe is that there aren't any custom paint jobs. At least, not yet. Landing the GR-7 conventionally is pretty simple. Just be aware that the landing flaps are very effective, so you might not want to use them if you don't have a lot of runway for an extended landing run. No drag shoot or anything, but it's a VTOL jet, so yeah. Now, in terms of the VTOL stuff, 
It flies exactly like the earlier Harriers, and if you need a refresher, you should go watch my review on the Harrier Jump Jet family, where I go into more detail about flying the VTOL controls. The GR7 is exactly the same with all the VTOL stuff. Just be aware that some of the weapon loadouts will be too heavy for vertical takeoffs. Now the cockpit for the GR7 is amazing. It has excellent visibility, a huge radar warning receiver in a great spot, the FLIR display, and a fully featured HUD, as well as great visual detailing inside the cockpit. I loved flying this in VR, and between the HUD and the huge displays, I didn't have to go hunting around for an instrument even once. Plus, the pilot gets night vision goggles if you fly out on a night map. Great cockpit. To close out on the Harrier GR7. This jet is armed to the teeth with a top-end weapon system, a good targeting pod, night vision goggles, and a FLIR. It gets a strong assortment of guided air-to-ground weapons. It's just overflowing with countermeasures. It's got exceptional agility in a dogfight. And this is a VTOL jet. However, it doesn't have radar. Taking the targeting pod forfeits the gun pods. It has no tracers for any of its ammo belts. It's still subsonic, and it's one of the slowest top-tier jets currently in the game. And its engine overheats pretty easily. The final verdict on the Harrier GR7 is that, overall, this jet can be highly effective in just about every role if you practice a little bit. In air battles, the lack of radar is an issue, but if you can get through the opening BVR spam, it's great at close-in fighting. It ground battles, it takes a lot of spawn points to get into this thing with the good weapons, but when you do, it delivers. As always, thanks for watching.